Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Pastor Major H. Gibbs Senior, coming to you this morning from On the Wall of Ministries here in Alta Vista, Virginia. We're coming to you this morning at our Sunday School Live. We do thank God for you joining us, and uh, we're excited about everything that we are doing here at On the Wall of Ministries, God's Gift Ministries, Alta Vista Church Supply, Major Ministries. We are about to move uh, in 2025. We're going to have a new location uh, coming up for the coming year. We're uh, in the process of putting up buildings now in order for to put our shop in and also our broadcast uh, studio. So we thank God for you joining us and we're excited about our lesson, Josiah Celebrates the Passover. Coming to you our lesson four of our King James Version of our Standard Commentary. If you're using any uh, universal lesson plan, you can follow along with us this morning, but if you're using Union Gospel Press, it's a different lesson. So here we're coming out of the Second Chronicles 35th chapter verses 1 through 6, 16th through uh, 16th verse through the 19th verse. Again, as we studied, Josiah celebrates the Passover. As we studied this morning, our lesson aims is to be able to uh, explain the setting and the guidelines for the first Passover celebration that is mentioned in Exodus 12, and then evaluate the significance of Josiah's uh, renewal of the Passover observance for Israel's ongoing relationship with God. And then in our lesson, create a plan to revitalize a one neglected spiritual practice that you have in your own life. If it's prayer, if it's reading scripture, if it's somehow um, creating an atmosphere for you to grow closer to God. If you have neglected that in your life, you need to kind of uh, go back and look at that. So we have a beautiful lesson this morning as we read our line up online. Uh, uh, lesson this morning, we'll follow up with our discussion. Uh, Second Chronicles 35th chapter, verses 1 through 6, 16 through 19. Our scripture reads, Moreover, Josiah kept the Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And he set the priests in their charges and encouraged them uh, the service of the house of the Lord. And he said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord, Put the holy ark into the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build, and it shall not be a burden unto your shoulders. Serve now the Lord your God and the people Israel, and to prepare yourselves by the houses of your father after your courses, according to the writing of David, king of Israel, according to the writing of Solomon, his son. Verse 5. And, and stand in the holy place according to the division of the families of the fathers of your brethren, the people, and after the division of the families of the Levites. So kill the Passover, sanctify yourselves, and prepare brethren, prepare your brethren, that ye may be do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So all of the service of the Lord were prepared on the same day the, uh, to keep the Passover, to offer burnt offerings unto the altar of the Lord, according to the commandment of King Josiah. And the children of Israel that were present kept the Passover at that time, and the feast of unleavened bread seven days. And there was no Passover like that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all of the kings of Israel did such a Passover as Josiah kept. And the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. Again, we want to look at this morning, uh, setting some guidelines of the first Passover as we studied this in Exodus 12. And then evaluate the significance of this renewal of the Passover and create a plan to revitalize one area in your spiritual life uh, that you need to uh, somehow revitalize a neglected practice that you have been doing unto the Lord. So as we read this morning our introduction, rituals or ritualism. Now when you hear and read the word ritual, uh, it is your immediate reaction positive or is it negative? Chances are that uh, the first reaction is negative uh, as the word ritual conjures up mental images of tedious formal ceremonies that bear a little uh, relevance to the reality. We may also think of rituals as just going through the motions uh, and then of a periodic uh, observance where one's thoughts and attitudes don't match uh, one's actions while ritual is underway. But uh, aren't 
celebrations like birthdays and anniversaries and graduations, rituals in one good sense, perhaps we would move toward clarity by distinguishing between rituals as a good thing and ritualism as a bad thing. We humans, we need rituals, everyday habits, everyday traits that we do uh, so that we can flourish in our relationships. Rightly practiced, rituals will help us to remember the past and it explains the present and help us plan for the future. Mm -hmm. And then regarding our worship with God, rituals also have a meaning if we are followed with uh, uh, obedience to God. Further, ritualism without discernment risks placing people or person under divine judgment. Uh, God knows our ritual and that's why he established your annual feast and an Old Testament covenant people. And today, uh, as we study, we'll examine the renewed practice of one of those rituals. As we look at our lesson context this morning, uh, today's lesson uh, comes out of the year 623 uh, BC, uh, the 18th year of the reign of King Josiah, King of Judah. And this moves us toward uh, some 336 years after King Solomon's dedication of the temple at 959 BC. And 79 years after King Hezekiah's prayer of 702 B.C., in the year of 623 B.C. positions these events of today's lesson right about 100 years since the Assyrian Empire cast Israel's 10 tribes into exile and uh, unbeknowing to the Judeans at that time, their removal from the land lay only 37 years in the future, that is 586 B.C. And then 31 year reign of Josiah, uh, King Josiah over the southern kingdom of Judah was uh, a, a time of respite for the uh, consequences of sin. And uh, that was a direct result of Josiah's godly leadership. In process of purifying in the land or renovating the temple, a certain priest found a book of the law that the Lord had given unto Moses, and some today believe that it was a copy of Deuteronomy. And King Hosea was so shaken to the core that he heard the book read, Second Chronicles uh, 34 and 19. He acted immediately, receiving both bad and good news. In return, uh, even and he continued to exercise godly leadership in both uh, word and deed, his leadership included uh, instituting the celebration of the Passover mm -hmm. uh, or reinstituting uh, the, the uh, celebration of the Passover. Mm -hmm. And this neglected feast had been uh, instituted over 800 years previously to the Ma, to divine uh, a liberation uh, that Israel from Egyptian slavery. And the feast revival is the focus of our lesson this morning. Mm -hmm. First of all, we want to begin studying the preparation, taken out of the Second Chronicles 35th chapter, verses 1 through 6. It begins in verse 1. He says, Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover in the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. So here at the beginning of this verse begins in 2 Chronicles uh, uh, 35 and 19 uh, from the, uh, the bookends of our account in our text today. And it says here that the celebration of the Passover in our text was not only an act of obedience to the law of Moses, but it was an act of a covenant renewal. Passover had not been celebrated for some time, and at least in the manner of King Hosea intended it to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, King uh, Hezekiah, he reigned over Judah from 716 to 687 BC. He celebrated extended Passover after he had renovated and reopened the temple. But not since then had there been a celebration like King Josiah had intended. Mm -hmm. So it says in part B that they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first mm -hmm. month. Uh, this uh, text that they killed becomes clearer when we realize that the writer is talking about what? The Passover lamb, the Paschal lamb, the Paschal lamb. Uh, Jesus Christ was uh, considered the Paschal lamb that will what? Take away the sins of the world. So uh, he was what? A type and shadow of who was to come. So yeah. this lamb uh, was only a type and shadow because he said, the blood of goats and lambs cannot take away the sins of the earth. So uh, God had to bring what? Uh, a man down from heaven 
uh, by the name of Jesus that died who was able to take away all of the sins of the world. Amen. So here he's celebrating this Passover to be reinstated. Priest assigned. Verse 2 in our text says, And he sat the priests in their charges and encouraged them uh, to the service of the house of the Lord. Amen. He established an agenda. See, before you have anything, you got to have a plan. I, that's what I like about Mr. T. Mr. T said, I like to have a plan. And when a plan goes through, that means that you put the work in. So King Hosea, King uh, uh, Hosea, uh, Josiah, he had a plan. So he, we had a plan to be able to institute this, to be able to bring back that uh, ritual that had been neglected and bring it back into the house of the Lord. Then we get to verse 3. The Levites are instructed. And he said unto the Levites, and he taught all Israel which were holy unto the Lord. He told them to put the holy ark into the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build, and it should be not a burden upon your shoulders. Mm -hmm. See, he's telling them here, he taught all of them. He, he, he wanted them to understand the, uh, the gravity of the, uh, what they were going through. So he taught them and, uh, that they would be able to do the charges and the rituals that they had uh, uh, set aside. So here he said that uh, he they were holy. That meant they were consecrated and they were set aside. And the text here helps them to understand that they need to put the holy ark back in its place so that it can be able to do what God accomplished it to do. One time the yeah. ark was taken away and, and, and into the house of Obed-Eden. And, and they said, what happened to the house of Obed-Eden? The house of Obed-Eden was prospering. So they said, go get the ark and bring it back. Why are we going to let all of that success happen when right. God uh, had the ark to be in the temple so that it would be the presence of God in the, in the presence of the people so that people could know that God was near and always there. Amen. And then he says in part C, he said, it should not be a burden upon your shoulders. See, Come when you're working Come for on. the Lord, it should not be burdensome like work in a sense that uh, it's overbearing. So he said that uh, the Levites were the ones that was authorized to carry it, but he said it shall not be a burden to you. Mm -hmm. He said that he wants them to be aware of the difficulty of the job, but also to understand uh, that if they operate according to the word, the word said that don't touch the ark. You have to handle the ark by the stage. You remember when uh, the, 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 the man touched the ark, that when they moved the ark from Obed Eaton house and brought it back unto uh, the temple, that he touched it because yeah. it was falling. But it still don't touch the ark. So there are yeah. rules that they had to follow. So he said, you have to do those rules. And he said, serve now the Lord your God and his people. The Levites served God by what? Carrying out their duties. Yeah. You and I. We are not held responsible for anybody's duties other than our own. Amen. When God charges you, he makes you what? Accountable okay. for those things. So he said they were accountable for those charges. Verses 4 and 5 said, And prepare yourselves by the houses of your fathers after your courses, according to the writing of David, king of Israel, and according to the writing of Solomon, his son, and stand in that holy place according to the divisions of the families, of the fathers of your brethren and after the division of the families of the Levites. The Levites were what? To prepare themselves for service by organizing, I'm going to say it, organizing themselves uh, by their respective clans and their assignments. You remember when, when uh, uh, the father of John the Baptist, uh, when the father of John the Baptist was given the news about the birth of John the Baptist, you know, he kind of made jest of it and he what? He couldn't talk until after the birth of John the Baptist. Amen. But the thing is, when he was in the temple, when uh, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him, he was doing his course. Yes. That means that he had a designated time for him to light the incense or yes. carry out the charge inside of the temple. Amen. So here he said the Levites were to operate according to their course, according to how they were assigned. He said by the divisions of their families, and by the order of those things that were established uh, by the law of Moses. So yeah. King uh, uh, David of Israel had provided a list of these clans 
and Solomon had followed the same pattern, documenting them in 2 Chronicles 8 and 14, Levites like priests, they would rotate their service according to the divisions of the families and those assignments. Okay. All right. So here he says in verse 6, he says, So kill the Passover lamb, sanctify yourselves, and prepare your brethren that they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Right. Uh, this verse gives us, what, three instructions. Mm -hmm. He tells them to kill the Passover. That means kill the Passover lamb, a lamb without blemish. Any blemish will not take away the sin. So he said bring a, a what? A unblemished lamb, mm -hmm. kill that lamb, and then he said also sanctify yourselves. Make sure you selves have been sanctified. He says, since this was the only one of the several tasks assigned to them, they would require to purify themselves following the sacrifice. And this was the issue of setting a person or one thing apart for a, what, a, a sacred task. Uh, that means that they were set aside or they were set apart or sent. And then he said, prepare the brethren according to the word of the Lord. The four words uh, in a partial translate uncertainty in our text. It's kind of uncertainty, unknown that the textual variation, many manuscripts have been wording these translates that the Levites were to prepare their brethren. Other wording says that to prepare the Passover, prepare for the lamb that was going to be slaughtered. So get ready for it. Remember he told Jesus when he was getting ready for the Passover, he said, go and find a man and he'll have that upper room prepared. He'll walk with a basin and when you see him with that basin, tell him to prepare the upper room for the Passover meal. Amen. So everything had to be done according to the law of Moses. He said, prepare it for your brethren and do it according to the word of the Lord by the word that God has instructed through Moses to them. First of all, uh, we went through our text, but now let's get to celebration. How do we celebrate? Second Chronicles 35, 15 to 16 tells us about the celebration. Uh, verse 16 says, So all the service of the Lord was prepared on the same day to keep the Passover and to offer burnt offerings unto the altar of the Lord according to the commandment. This verse sums up the preparation that was prepared uh, in our text, it, it says that at least 41,400 animals were available for the sacrifice in Joseph Passover. That was more than twice that Hezekiah did when he, uh, uh, when he, uh, uh, when they uh, dedicated the, te the second temple, mm -hmm. the second time. But he said that there was more in the rededication than it was in the dedication. Right, he said, and also burnt offerings unto the altar of the Lord according to the instructions of King Uzziah. Old Testament lists four types of blood sacrifices. Uh, a burnt offering, a peace offering, a sin offering, and a guilt offering. And these were discussed throughout the book of Leviticus. Two of those four types are present here. The Passover animal was the peace offering. One thing in our text about burnt offerings was that the meat was available to eat uh, from peace offerings, but not from burnt offerings. Right. And bulls are often used in burnt offerings, and the whole animal was burned up to God. All and right. it was a dedication offering and that the worshiper gave God everything, and it expressed total commitment. So right. when they did offerings, it had to be uh, according to the law, whether it was going to be a burnt offering, peace offering, a sin offering, or a guilt offering. And uh, verse 17 says, And the children of Israel were present, and he kept the Passover at that time, and the feast of unleavened bread was seven days. Uh, this meal continued throughout the week, followed by the feast of unleavened bread. And sometimes they always around the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread always together because they followed one another. And during this Passover celebration, the Israelites were prepared to flee from Egypt at that time. Hence, they consumed the, uh, the meal readily. That's why they had to make what? Unleavened bread. Uh, they didn't have time for the bread to rise. So he said, make haste yeah. and get out of Israel. So as a result, they ate the unleavened bread without the yeast because mm -hmm. there was no time for the bread to rise. Amen. Verse 17, 18 says, And there was no Passover like that kept in Israel all the days of Samuel the prophet, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept. 
Samuel considered the last of the judges of and the first of the prophets. They served judges from uh, 1067 to 1043 B.C. And then they had been not such a Passover kept in over 400 years. So it dwarfed Hezekiah's uh, Passover celebration when they uh, rebuilt the temple. But it did so regarding the first Passover after return some 106 years later. And then no figures or numbers or animals or sacrifice are given for the latter, but comparing the two dedications of the temple might be insightful. Moses dedicated the first temple 142,000 animals, while the dedication of the second temple involved a little over 700 animals. The magnitude is what, 200 to 1. And then Paul says, and the priests and the Levites in Judah, and they were present, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We read the attendees include what? All Judah and all Israel. And remember these two designations. One identified the southern kingdom and the other the northern kingdom. Uh, the southern kingdom had two tribes, but the northern kingdom had ten tribes. And many members later had been exiled a hundred years earlier. And thus Israel would refer uh, to the few who had not been taken. Mm -hmm. So here in our text, uh, we are looking at verse 19. It says, in the year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. See, moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and wizards and, and, and those uh, idols and abominations were spied in the land of Israel. And, uh, and the Josiah put away all of those things. And then he performed the words of the Lord that were written in the book so that the word of the Lord could be uh, the last thing that is being said. See, mm -hmm. the word of the Lord should have amen at the end, ain't it? Amen. So when the, you end your life with the word of the Lord, everything is going to be all right. So you should end that with the word of the Lord. So he said that was a no greater uh, Passover that was kept none other like Josiah. So as we conclude this morning, embracing rituals, when Josiah kept the Passover, he became a model of ritual faithfulness and that originated in his heart. God had instituted certain rituals in the new uh, covenant and then leave uh, and then at least two come up immediately to mind. What? Baptism and Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. Baptism is a ritual of reenacting what? Christ's burial and resurrection. And the Lord's Supper reacts to what? The Passover meal that Jesus shared with his followers. And then that night he was betrayed. And the, man, the meal should help us to remember Christ's sacrifice, his death, and focus our attention on hope of his future return to receive us unto himself. The rituals invite you uh, to participate in God's mission and God's story of redemption. And then the touchstones of this continuity and stability that they teach and they remind us that God delights in our obedience as we seek him through what he has commanded us to do. So our prayer this morning is Heavenly Father, Rekindle that appreciation uh, for your rituals. Focus our hearts and minds that we will observe these rituals so that we might remember your salvation and recommit our lives to you. Show us how we can observe these rituals of worship without becoming ritualistic. We pray, pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the household of faith say amen. So our thought to remember this morning, embrace God's rituals, but don't let the ritual become ritualistic. God bless you. May heaven ever yeah. smile upon you. We'll be back yeah. after a, a, minute, a few minutes break, coming back for our morning message at our worship hour. God bless you. May heaven ever smile upon you.